Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 171. Are you writing efficient Python with as few lines of code as possible? Are you familiar with the many built-in language features that will simplify your code and make it more Pythonic? Christopher Trudeau is back on the show this week, bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We discuss a recent post from Bob Belderboss titled, Make Each Line Count, Keeping Things Simple in Python. We provide many of our favorite Pythonic examples and the language mistakes we've learned from. We also share multiple resources to add to your learning path. Microsoft has announced a limited beta program for Python inside of Excel. We dig into the current details, requirements, and potential use cases. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a group of announcements from the Python Software Foundation, a showcase of the Polar's data frame library, Immortal Objects in Python, a Code Image Generator project, an MS Paint clone in the terminal, and a Django ORM cheat sheet. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher. It's been a little while, but uh, welcome back. It's been a long while, but I, I'll, I'll save you from me singing the theme to the Enterprise <laughs> there for you. Sure, that sounds good. <laughs> but we have uh, some news to catch up on and a whole bunch of articles and projects to share with everybody this week. Let's dig into some news. For sure. Four different things from the Python Software Foundation. All right. Been a month since we last chatted, so uh, some of this isn't very recent, but I'll cover them all in case uh, our listeners use us as the source of their news. Yeah. The first two items are releases. So Python 3.12 RC1 came out at the beginning of August, and then on top of that, all the other maintained Pythons also got a release. So that's 3.11.5, 3.10.13, 3.9.18, and 3.8.18. Those increments are brought to you by a fixed vulnerability in the SSL socket layer. So go get your patch because that's security stuff. Yeah. Uh, Next bit of news is PyPI has a new safety and security engineer. His name is Mike Fiedler. Um, And if you're feeling a bit of deja vu, this is actually a different position from the new security developer in residence. Mike's going to be full-time on PyPI stuff, which is a new thing. The position is funded by AWS, and I love that companies are starting to sponsor these. Yeah. And, you know, it strengthens open source for all of us. This is a great way for uh, good work to get done. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, Seth Larson, his announcement as as the, the security developer, it's looking great on the security front for future Python stuff. Yeah, and, and those things are very, very important too, right? Like it's, uh, the language is wide adoption, and, and so uh, we need to, We need things to be bulletproof. Yeah. And then the last bit of PSF news was their annual report came out. Uh, This would be the 2022 annual report. So suddenly I'm not feeling so bashful about announcing RC1 from a month ago. Yeah, (laughs) kidding aside, uh, this doc tells you uh, what went on at the PSF last year. So if you're interested in all the changes and plans, you can check out the link we have for that. Yeah, you can see some of those faces uh, behind all the stuff happening. Yes. And then one last little thing, a bonus fifth piece of news. Congratulations to the Pydantic folks. They just surpassed 1 billion downloads. So that's uh, McDonald's Burger Country. So kudos to you folks. (laughs) Okay. Cool. I guess that gets us right into topics this week. And I was going to go first. And I think when you saw this, you're like, oh, Chris will talk about this one. This is a real Python article about Polars, which I've been kind of off and on talking about over the last year or so. The title is Python Polars, a lightning fast data frame library. It's a real Python tutorial by author Harrison Hoffman. He's uh, one of our new 
people on the team and congratulations to him on his first article. This is what's called a showcase tutorial. I still need to learn exactly what that means, but I, I, I feel like the plan is that it's going to give you an introduction to the library, things like how to install it and the different sort of configurations. And then it has a bit of hands-on uh, with some of the core features. And then like we like to do where you might want to go next in your exploration of the package um, or uh, whatever the project is that we're showcasing. Quick shout out to Aldrin. Aldrin is somebody who does all the artwork on Real Python. He's been doing fantastic artwork for quite a while. And uh, Gary Arna mentioned this in a recent meeting, and then I have to agree with him, that he can make super cute polar bears just like he's been doing pandas for a while now. So if you're not familiar with polars, I might suggest that you check out a previous episode, uh, number 140. I talked to Liam Brannigan about the library. He's been working on documentation on polars for a little while, and he also developed a training course on the library. And we discussed that. We discussed the library. We dig pretty deep into it. And I think it'd be a really good companion to what's in this showcase tutorial. Polars is a data frame library. It's really similar to Pandas, hence why I mentioned that a second ago. It's built in Rust. It's very fast. I feel noticeably fast. I was actually surprised when I used it, just doing sort of simple things, how quick and peppy it is. It handles data natively in the Apache Arrow format, which is something that I've been discussing a lot lately um, in a couple different forms. In fact, a very recent interview with Mark Garcia, uh, 167, where we talked about Pandas 2.0 and them, well, in kind of in his words, a little bit that it's a slow adoption of the Apache Arrow format. It's there, but it's something that people have to embrace to get into. Here, it's built in. It's the default. And it has some big advantages, uh, again, to do with speed and things like that. So this article is a good way to get started with this library. Again, you get in, start by installing it. And there's a couple different ways that you could do that. You can do simple pip install of pullers. But there is a, a couple of these sort of, I don't want to call them flags, but little square bracket ways that you can install the library for additional support or kind of library things that might be handy. There's a square bracket notation where you can have NumPy comma pandas in it. And that's one that he suggests to follow along with the step-by-step -step stuff that he shows a little later because there's ability to kind of push stuff in and out of, you know, to pandas or from pandas and, and have it kind of work with that. Another way to do it is to have the square brackets all to include all of those options that you might want to do. But of course, that would be a slightly larger install. You practice building some frames. In this particular case, you start with randomly generated data, kind of NumPy style, and he walks you through some of the standard data exploration tasks you'd want to do with a data frame. Things like methods that the names are very similar and the footprints are very similar to pandas if you haven't worked with polars yet. It has dot head, which you can look at the top rows. One nice thing that's added there is it not only formats the data very nicely inside of a terminal window and make sure that it can fit, it also shows the data types, which I think is really handy. That would usually be a separate command inside of pandas to do. You can also use a dot describe method, which is really nice. And that is, again, just like pandas, it shows you the summary statistics like the count, you know, null counts, mean, standard deviation, all those kinds of things that you'd like. One thing that is truly different from Pandas is it does not use indexes. I think that's great. And Richie Vink, the guy who created Polars, is very adamant that they're not needed. So he takes you through how you might do that sort of selection and what are called sort of contexts and dot select by using column. There's also kind of some powerful stuff you can do with the dot select method where you can do piping and almost sort of creating query like steps that you would want to build in there. I'll have you dig into the article, learn a little more about that. You learn a little bit about how to do aggregation inside of this. And then the other big area that this showcase focuses on is the lazy API. Polars is able to evaluate really sophisticated expressions on large data sets while keeping memory efficiency. And that's, again, kind of that tie-in with not only what's happening with Apache Arrow internally, but this lazy API allows you to look at really big things and then choose when you want it to actually pull these 
operations. You sort of can specify the sequency of operations and not immediately have to run them. Instead, you can have them saved. And there's actually a command to say, you know, basically run them at this point. There's a collect command you could do. So he digs into all those details. It has another feature of allowing you to scan data. So say you have a huge online CSV you want to access, you can scan the file rather than reading the entire file in a memory. Pullers will create a lazy frame that then sort of references that file's data. And no computation would be performed until you run this thing dot collect. He talks a little bit about integration with external data, along with CSVs, which I mentioned, JSON, Parquet, Avro, which I haven't studied yet, Excel, and various database connections. The one thing I mentioned, again, in the installation part, he mentions, including the pandas and NumPy stuff, he shows you how to do this dot two pandas or dot two NumPy to create those types of data frames or those types of arrays. And then he covers a little bit more of some links to how to learn more and some of the other more advanced methods and things that you might want to do with it. Again, a showcase. One thing that I think is really fun about Polars right now is it's moving fast. It's a pretty new library, but there's a lot of momentum behind it. And like Will McGugan's formation of the textual company, which I think we've mentioned a few times here, Polars, I mentioned maybe a couple weeks ago, or I guess over a month now, Polars is forming a company, which um, I think will also help it continue to move along. I think it's really nimble, you know, in the way that they're kind of doing stuff and building. The one caveat is that if you're in a legacy situation that has always used pandas or is using very specific things there, kind of that existing code setup that's already been created for a while, where pandas is at the heart of that, it might take a little longer for you to figure out how you could kind of move into something else. But if you're experimenting with data science and you're running things from the beginning, I think Polars can really give you a leg up as far as speed. I think one other thing, there was a, a release that I'll mention that 0.19 just came out. And I think that happened before, just before we put the news together this week. And I'll include links to those podcasts and to the recent release notes. So what's your first one here? My first one's called Introducing Immortal Objects for Python, and it's by Eddie Elizondo. Eddie works for Meta, which is the artist formerly known as Facebook, in the Instagram division. Instagram's a Python Django shop, yep. and as you might imagine, they run at a scale that most of the rest of the world can't comprehend. Uh, maybe I should just speak for myself. I can't quite comprehend. <laughs> uh, the, their architecture uses both multiprocessing as well as async I.O. for concurrency. And to help with the scale, they do a lot of caching and, interestingly enough, have a fair number of read-only objects. The article doesn't get into specifics there, but I you know, can imagine things like configuration and stuff like that that is shared across a lot of components. That's going to be something that isn't going to be changing. Knowing that an object is read-only can make a big difference with shared memory, as it means you'll never have to sync that across to other processes, and so it saves a whole bunch of overhead. And although they have these objects that they never touch, that actually turns out doesn't mean Python doesn't touch them. They did some deep analysis, and it turns out that due to the way reference counting works, which is part of the garbage collection process, the object's metadata, yeah, that's right, that's meta ob, meta's object's metadata, uh, <laughs> still gets touched. So in short, these read-only objects are being written to, they just don't have their values changed. And this brings me back to the fun part of the title, Immortal Objects. So the folks at Instagram created PEP 683, which proposed the ability to mark an object as immortal, meaning it would never change. By being able to flag an object this way, you can gain efficiency as the garbage collector basically doesn't have to touch it. Not something I think that most of us will be using tomorrow, but having features like this means that Python continues to be a language that the big players can use, uh, which is good for all of us. PEP 683 has been accepted, and this feature is going to be in October's 3.12 release. So go mark your objects as immortal. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I wonder if, because it is an online service that kind of needs to be there at all times, if, if that's part of it or... 
Uh, the article did talk a little bit about like warming machines up and and that kind of which is typical a uh, problem at scale, right? Because uh, you if it takes a while for a machine to warm up, you can't wait until you have a problem to turn it on. So you have to always have yeah. some in standby, whatever. And you've got a in the case of shared memory, that would mean syncing the memory with the machines that are already running. So yeah, there's there's uh, a, there's a lot of overhead there. There's a graph in the article, and essentially it's like a logarithmic curve. Uh, against these kinds of objects when they didn't have the immortality and it huh. almost completely inverts the other way by being able to turn it on because like there's a little bit of startup cost and after that it's like nothing happens so it uh, it saves them at their scale uh, a significant amount of memory and process wow cool this week i want to shine a spotlight on another real python video course it showcases a tool for manipulating graphics and pictures inside of Python. It's titled Process Images Using the Pillow Library and Python. The course is based on a real Python tutorial by Steven Gruppetta. And in the video lessons, Darren Jones takes you through how to read images with Pillow and perform basic image manipulation, like cropping, resizing, changing the format or the mode, how to work with individual color channels, and how to use Pillow for image processing, like blurring, sharpening, smoothing, and enhancing. You also learn how to superimpose images and use NumPy with Pillow for further processing. And you'll also learn how to create animations using Pillow. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to work with and manipulate images inside of Python. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections, and where needed, include code samples for the techniques shown. In fact, this one includes not only the code examples, but images for you to experiment with as you dig into the course. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. So my next one was something I was very excited about when I heard about it, that Microsoft speaking of other large companies there, they're introducing Python inside of Excel. And I'd heard the rumblings of this for quite a while now. What's kind of a little hard about this is that it's a real slow rollout and they give you all these steps of how to do it and then kind of really hidden within this article. If you really are searching for it, you'll see that that they are just slow rolling it out. And it's not quite obvious when you'll be picked. Somebody does offer eventually a way to sort of sign up for it. Um, I had to kind of dig into the comment sections and so forth. So I, it's one of these that I'm not sure what's involved in this sort of uh, quote unquote public preview, but I'm excited by it. I have done a lot of work inside of Excel and now having some wanting some skills that go beyond Visual Basic uh, is, I think, really kind of cool. I know there are some security concerns that people could have that are working with it, but I think that's something that'll be maybe addressed as you go. It's a very interesting behavior. Uh, you, It isn't using Python installed on your machine. So that's, you know, kind of the first caveat. So it's not going to look at what version number you have or what libraries you have or a virtual environment or anything like that. It's actually using Azure sort of in the cloud with an Anaconda distribution. So it's a bit of a partnership with Anaconda in that way, but the cloud stuff is happening all inside of Microsoft Azure. And it seems like it just sort of sends it up when you run that particular cell. So in some ways, if you've ever done large Excel spreadsheets that have lots of formulas and functions and things in it where you open it and you look at it and then maybe you change a few things and you end up having to sort of run all <laughs> functions again to have it kind of update and, and so forth. I feel like that would be maybe kind of a similar situation here where it would have to go and have an internet connection to, to be able to do that. But otherwise, you know, anything that you've already run would be displaying inside the sheet. I will include a link to one of the better sort of introductions to Python and Excel YouTube videos. And it gave me a really good idea of kind of how the workflow is. A couple things that are kind of interesting to me about it. There's a 
some things that are kind of hidden as you do it when you select, say, a table of rows and columns inside of your Excel, you can highlight them and inside making this little sort of a cell where you want to run Python, you hit, you hit equals PY, and then you can start to run whatever kind of Python code you want. You can expand this to be as large of a sort of script area that you'd want. You can use hashtags to do comments, um, just like normal. A couple things are already imported, which is partly where I feel like it gets a little odd for somebody maybe trying to learn this. Data frames are ready to go. It's got pandas ready to go in it. So when you select that range of columns and rows, you can quickly turn that into a data frame. You can name that data frame if you want, so you can reference it again instead of setting, saying, hey, reference this particular Excel battleship style <laughs> column and row. You can you know, do all the typical things that you can do in Pandas, which I think for some people, that, especially that are coming from the Python side, will find this to be really quick and, and easy to do. Grouping, aggregating, you know, doing those kinds of things, or even you know, creating plots because it uses a lot of the standard Pandas uh, stuff. Like you, know, you can literally say data frame dot plot and start putting in parameters and so forth. A couple of things that are interesting to me, once you've, you've run that Excel script, you'll see it just as like a little cell there as this Python object that's there. But if you want, you can click a button on the side that you can say, actually send this back into Excel data and then it would output it like you'd see a little table output inside of your sheet. And so that kind of going in to Python, coming out of Python to back to Excel is kind of an interesting little dance that I think will be interesting to kind of play with. And is that like, is that what you think the primary purpose is here, right? Like it's like import, export data kind of sort of yeah ETL-ish kind of things rather than say as a replacement for Visual Basic inside of it? Is that is that the general idea? Um, that's how they're presenting it right now. Again, in the sort of ability to do common things that, that somebody doing data exploration or Things that you could probably do in Excel, but might be quicker to do with a uh, you know a data frame library. I haven't seen it doing really much more advanced things. Maybe those videos will be coming again. These are early days, and I didn't get invited yet <laughs> to play with it. Um, but I, I definitely think I, I don't know if it's going to be this thing where you'll have like package structures and you'll you'll be able to kind of share your code in other ways outside of what's here. It, it definitely needs the quote-unquote Azure cloud to, to be able to, you know, rerun these things. And I'm not sure. I think that's a lot of questions people have of like, well, where does this fit? Am I going to be able to make sort of application kinds of things inside of Excel? Yeah. I, one of the things I, the headlines, I think, caused my brain to go in a completely different place as to what they've done with it. And I got very excited, and then it wasn't what I expected. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and now I'm not sure what I would do with this. And I, that's not to say there isn't value there for folks, because I'm not a data person, right? So that, like, right. I understand that that whole data pipeline piece, Excel is a common solution to those parts. Sure. It just, there, there was this sort of moment of hype where I was like, oh, I could get out of Visual Basic. That would be so fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, oh, well, not really. And by the way, you need to work in the cloud and a whole bunch of other things. And I was like, okay, I'm not sure I see the where it goes yeah. yet. So, uh, well, interesting to see what they do with it. You know, the idea that, oh, I could have Python tied together all these things like, you know, I could have people entering in values inside of an Excel sheet and then it could be gathering them and and I could have some, you know, program that's running that, you know, is doing that. I don't know if that's you know, kind of the stuff that you want to do where that, that would maybe have been things that you would have done with Visual Basic before. So, yeah, it's kind of leaning toward the Anaconda uses. It, it does include some libraries, like I mentioned, you know, Pandas already. It, again, you don't even have to import it, but I guess uh, Matplotlib is there, Seaborn, Stats Models, and then, you know, because it's Pandas, it's got NumPy. Those are the ones that they mentioned. What was really interesting, though, in one of the demonstrations that I saw is that things that are not there, you know, by default that you would have to say import, like let's say you want to do regular expressions, which is something that, you know, is kind of a power feature that, 
might be a little harder to do, you know, built into Excel. You can import RE and then start, you know, running regular expressions. And they, they kind of gave an example of that. So that feels kind of weird. Like, I don't, I don't know how many people are going to know the terminology. Oh, I need to import things to be able to do it. So it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's very interesting. Microsoft's very excited about it. Again, my caution to, I don't know how soon you'll be able to play with it yourself. I have a Windows machine that I, I fired up and, and so forth, and I went through. It's a lot of steps to to kind of get into what's called the beta channel, and then you kind of have this expectation, oh, oh, great, it updated. I should have this version. But it's not really, that's not really what it's done. That's kind of what I think the article kind of missed there. You have to really look to see, oh, well, actually... I guess your username would get invited and then maybe you would get that particular beta seed as part of the insider program. So, you know, it's interesting to see what it's going to do. I, I don't know if it's going to, you know, solve things for everyone, but I am excited by the future. And I'd like to get somebody on the show to talk about it. Anthony Shaw was mentioning some stuff on, uh, you know, he works for Microsoft and I think he was doing some stuff with it. I know Guido, who also sort of works for Microsoft, was mentioning it also. So it'd be nice to get somebody, you know, from the Python community who's connected there with Microsoft on the show to to give me a little more heads up as to maybe some of the questions that you had, like, you know, you know what is this answering and what is it building on top of? So, but uh, definitely a, a watch this space thing. And I'm excited by some of the stuff that's there. And again, as somebody who is more comfortable with doing things inside of Python, which maybe we'll talk about more here in a minute in our discussion, how this might actually make things inside of Excel a little easier. So what's your next one? I've got a real Python article by Philip Baskany, and it's called Build a Code Image Generator with Python. This is one of those demo-based step-by-step articles. The premise is you've got a chunk of code that you want to show off somewhere, and you want to do that with an image rather than text. And that might be because you're using it in a video or posting it somewhere and you need to include things like syntax highlighting. So you're trying to get sort of a, a screenshotish kind of thing. Yeah. The project works by using Flask to build a small site that serves the code, Jinja templates for the layout, pigments to colorize the code, and Playwright to create the images by capturing them off of the site. So that's a lot of moving pieces. Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually the great thing about these kinds of articles. You get to see a bunch of different stuff in action, and but it's got a purpose. It's not just, you know, oh, this is what Flask is for. This is you're actually doing something. It's not a bunch of foobar examples, but a tool you can use by the time you're done. The article's divided into five steps. The first step walks you through getting started, shows you how to create a virtual environment, install all the dependencies, etc. So like if you're new to these mechanisms, you can start right there. So just a bit of basic Python is all you need to do to get going. Gives a brief introduction to Playwright. If you've not used that before, it's similar to Selenium. If that explanation didn't help, that's a web browser driver. So it allows you to programmatically control a web browser this kind of tool is often used for testing, so you can you know, make it click on things and check that they work. Playwright works in headless mode, which means it doesn't pop and open the browser, uh, does it behind the scenes, uh, which again is really useful if you're testing because you don't want a stray click mucking with your tests and interfering. So this is the way to go. Once you've toured Playwright, it's uh, time to actually start writing some code. Um, the idea is to create a website that serves that colorized code which Playwright then visits and captures. So if you want a website quickly in Python, the answer is usually Flask. And so here you get Flask going in you know, four or five lines of code, and that's why Flask is very popular. Flask has some expectations about project layout, uh, particularly when you're dealing with things like templates. So you know it's a framework rather than a library. Uh, so the rest of the first step really guides you through what that looks like and gets you all set up. So step two is where you start actually building the meat of the website. The goal is to get that a web page that has an input field which you put code into. And then when you hit submit, it outputs the colorized format. So if you've ever used highlight.me, it's uh, kind of like that. And if you've never used highlight.me, you should. It supports all the languages. I did a quick count and it was like over 250 choices. So it's crazy. Oh, wow. Anyways. To duplicate Highlight Me, you need to create a web page that accepts some code and then outputs it. And step two is all about dealing with this and rendering the result. 
The next part here introduces the idea of a web session, which is a temporary storage mechanism that's often used by websites to track users' choices and data. Uh, it's kind of usually the step before pushing things down into the database. Flask supports this, uh, so it allows you to sort of remember the last thing that was displayed, so they add that into the project. So on to step three. Uh, Pigments is one of my favorite little utility libraries. It does syntax highlighting over 500 markup and programming languages. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is where Highlight Me gets its highlighting features, and it's why it can support so many choices. Real Python itself actually uses pigments to colorize code in the articles. And uh, if any of you have taken one of my courses, the tool I use that looks like I'm editing code, which is a big fat lie, it's an animation sort of presentation tool. It also uses pigments. So the same tool can output to like RTF and other things and all that's powered by this colorization of pigments. So the what the article is talking about then is how you take pigments and apply it to the colorized output on your web page. And it even includes like a little style picker because pigments has preset palettes and things. So you can choose uh, what your what the flavor of your output looks like. So there's two more steps to go, but you've already got a useful little tool. Step four uses Playwright to visit your pretty new site and capture an image of your highlighted code, while step five does some polishing, improving the overall user experience. So I often find I learn more from these kinds of articles because they're so practical, uh, and you get the added benefit of creating a useful tool. So if you want to pick up Flask or Pigments or Playwright, um, this is article is actually a great way to be introduced to those packages, and you end up with a fun little exercise once you're done. Yeah, cool. I just had uh, Philip on the show uh, to talk about another one of his tutorials. This one was about sort of finding the best programming font and i had thought to myself oh fonts i'm not sure if that's something i want to cover on a, a python podcast and then I, I found lots of interesting stuff in it so hope people will enjoy that one and I want to thank philip for coming on the show again i think that takes us into our discussion this week right yeah and I, we're going to talk about something that kind of kicked off from an article by bob belderbus and it's called make each line count keeping things simple in python the main argument of the article is fewer lines tend to be better. Yeah. It usually means less code to read and less chances of a bug. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean compacting things for the sake of it, but more along the lines of choosing the right approach. It's tied to, you know, in the Zen of Python, that whole simple is better than complex, complex is better than complicated. Bob goes through a series of short examples where he shows a more Pythonic way to accomplish something with less code. So as demonstration, the first example is a function that checks if a number is divisible by multiple divisors. The go-to here without even thinking about it would just loop over the divisors and check each one. But Bob's simpler version uses the all built-in function and a comprehension, reducing four lines into one. So there are actually a couple of good articles on Real Python that cover both all and its cousin any. Yeah. And they're useful for this kind of thing. So if you're looking for some examples about how to take advantage of those functions, to check out the links. I think those are so cool too. Like the the fact that, you know, they're written in C and then they also have short circuiting in them so that they don't, like in the case of all, if it finds one that isn't, <laughs> that isn't, if you will, then it basically stops, you know, and the same with any. And as long as it finds one, then it's good, you know? Yeah, so they, they tend to be performant, yeah. So did you have a favorite example or examples of your own that uh, sort of fit into this realm? Yeah, I think his ones are, are really nice. I, I hesitate on the list comprehension one sometimes. Um, I think they they look very elegant, but occasionally people try to do like a list comprehension inside of a list comprehension, and then it gets a little hard to parse. <laughs> so that goes back to that Zen of Python. Is it easy to read and understandable and you know stuff like that too? But um, generally, th they are nice. So. And that, you know, that that's the challenge with this, right? My idea of what is simple might not be your idea of what is simple. And so you're always, you're immediately into the, you know, the subjective space. I have two that are just right off the top of my head. Like the way that you can very quickly swap two variables inside of Python has always been one of these kind of weird, like almost like programming quiz questions. It has to do with a, a feature that involves tuples or tuples, however you want to pronounce it. But you can have, say, two variables, A and B, so A comma B. And if you wanted that to make the values of 
A be inside of B and B be inside of A. In Python, you can actually just type out A comma B equals B comma A and boom, one line. And it, it does that swapping for you. There's no temporary variable. There's nothing inside of there. And having written things out before that, you know, had to have like this other third thing that was holding values temporarily. Um, that's kind of a neat, elegant thing that which is nice. The other one that was a big wake-up call for me, very, very young Python developer coming from lots of other things. Well, in this case, it was JavaScript. Um, when I wanted to do a for loop, I did it JavaScript style initially. Your initial value, um, and then you like were saying, okay, how many times am I going to go through this? And then you're incrementing it. And now that I know about iterables inside of Python and the fact that I can just say for variable name, for i in whatever the name of the iterable is, and colon, and it's just going to go through each one of those automatically. There's no increments. It just goes until the iterable is exhausted. It's just really elegant. So for loops in Python, it's one of those things where you can very quickly tell if somebody knows Python or not, and definitely would you would have figured me out at the time. It's like, yeah, that is Python, but it's not Pythonic. Yeah, and, and this is one of the things when you're picking up a new language, right? Like the first thing you have to master is the syntax because otherwise you're not going to get anywhere. You've got to start with the syntax. But then there's the better knowledge of the tools within it, right? Yeah. And that can make a world of difference, not just in the performance in your code, but in the performance of you as the developer as yeah. you know how, how you write things out. And, and it's also one of, to me, I often find it's a source of frustration when I go the other way. Because if I, if I have to go and write some JavaScript, it's like, oh, okay, what's the syntax for? Oh, it's for each in this language. Because that's what I want. Because that's what I'm used to because of Python. <laughs> and so I, yeah. I'm doing the other thing. I've got my round uh, peg and I'm trying to squish it into the square hole because now I spend most of my time in the Python world. Yeah, uh, a couple other ones that I really like. If you're working with lots of strings or maybe you're making a string, you know, from an iterable, there's this dot join thing that is really kind of elegant. I, I see all this code examples from Garana often and he's doing things of like creating cards or creating like a deck of things and so forth. And he'll have like this sort of comma inside of parentheses dot join and then it's grabbing everything in that iterable and putting it together. And I think that one's really elegant. And then the other one I wanted to mention just kind of quickly is a enumerate, which I think is really powerful. Again, kind of talking about iterables again, but and maybe potentially for loops, the idea of adding enumerate and then it basically returning not only the iterable items one by one, but also the index that it's in. And so you can kind of have that sort of count as you go um, instead of having to like try to generate one as you're as you're counting along going through the for loop or, or whatever it is you're enumerating through very elegant but yeah there's tons of these built in so that you kind of just need to learn about them and we're going to give a few articles that can direct you a little bit but what were some of the ones that you had uh, well one of the ones i i've just almost always done in almost every programming language i've ever used and uh, it's it's a simple simple thing but Oftentimes, you end up in a situation where you're like, if this, assign this to a variable, else assign that to a variable. And I find it so much cleaner to provide a default value. So what would go in the else clause goes up top, assign it, and then do the if and change it. Uh -huh. And technically, that is less performant because that assignment is expensive. You're doing something that gets thrown away. Yeah. But on a modern processor, this is not going to be what eats up your CPU time. And it completely, if it's a simple one-liner, it goes from being this indent, outdent, indent, outdent to just three lines of code and maybe it's a personality quirk but i find it just looks so much cleaner and it, it's something i've done in pretty much all the programming languages i've written and I, I continue to do it in python feel free to be angry at me in the in the comments about it <laughs> sure there's um you know generally there's some libraries so the the built-in zip function and most of iter tools yeah there's a there's a whole depth there that are things that you commonly have to do and they're done for you. And uh, knowing that they exist can make a big difference to your coding. And it's sort of similar to, you know, things like enumerate that you're you're mentioning, right? Like if you don't have enumerate, well, then I would create a variable and I would set it to zero and then I'd have to add an, incre you know, incrementer inside of the loop and, oh no, well, now I know enumerate works. I don't have to do that. And zip and iter tools are very much like that. 
Yeah. And there's a third party package I came across uh, recently. Yeah, Michael Kennedy actually, uh, some of his code was using it, is more iter tools and it's iter tools on steroids. It's just like, it's like, oh, I wish I need, I need to do this and I wish iter tools could do it. And it's in the same flavor and it's just dozens and dozens of functions that are really, really useful. The example that I used recently is when you're outputting something to the web, you often want to put it in like rows. And yeah. so you, you, you've you got this long list of things. Well, more iter tools has something, I think it's called chunk. And essentially it will give you pieces of a iterable in tuples. So it'll give you the first three in a tuple, then the next three in a tuple, and then the next three in a tuple. And yeah. for, for displaying in rows on the web in rows of three, this is really, really handy. And I've usually have to write three or four lines of code for that. And so knowing that that's out there, that's three more lines you don't, you don't use just a quick little import <laughs> yeah exactly and uh, the last one uh, that i think uh, uh, always needs some love these people to need to know about is uh, default dict yeah so uh, if you're doing a uh, so he talks about using get with a dictionary to provide a default value yeah but a common pattern you have with a dictionary is let's say you want your key to point to a list of things so you end up in your code having to go, oh, wait, does this key exist yet? No, it doesn't. I'll create the empty list and then put the thing in the list. And so you're back into that sort of if-else short thing in order to get just stick something in the dictionary. Well, the default dict takes care of that for you. So I think my most common use of it is to say, hey, this dictionary starts it. Everything in it is a list. So you start with a brand new key and it creates the, uh, the list for you. So you can just assume the list is there and then do the append inside of it. That one I find is is one of those that I remember when I discovered it. I'm like, oh, this is great. This saves me three lines of code. And it's silly that something that saves you three lines of code would bring you joy, but uh, it did. Yeah. And it does. Yeah. I saw an, an example um, somewhere where they were using a handful of these iter tool ones. One that I thought was kind of cool is called Cycle, which just allows you to have sort of repeating patterns that, that can address, you know, what's in your iterator. So you could have it say, have every other letter do this or whatever, and it can have this very repeatable pattern across the whole iterable. Yeah, in fact, that that one's actually been extended into the Django template framework because that's really, okay. really common on the web. If you want to do like zebra striping, yeah, you need a style for each row. You need it every other row. So you use the, the cycle filter and it's the same concept. And it's, uh, okay, for, so the first time through the loop, give me style blue and give the second time through the loop, give me style red. And then the third time through the loop, give me style blue and cycle on it. So that's it's a, a common use for that kind of thing. Yeah, and then kind of in the same family of... Uh any and all um there's you know max and min built-in stuff that's really nice div mod is kind of a cool built-in that when you go do a division it can give you not only you know the amount of the division but also the remainder just as a tuple coming back which is kind of nice there's just so many built-ins that are fantastic and that's just this whole exploration of the language batteries included yeah and people are a little you know uh, Nervous to sometimes open up, you know, the the docs at Python dot uh, org, and I I really suggest it. It's actually there are examples. I feel it's written well. If anything, every version it's getting written a little better. Error codes are getting written better. It's just something where I think you should explore it, and they're written in C, so they're optimized and. It's definitely that whole thing of learning the language. And with a lot of them, you don't have to know their ins and outs, right? Like, yeah, if you can just, the only thing you have to remember is that it exists, right? <laughs> I know roughly what zip is for. I almost always have to look it up every time I use it, but right. it's not something because I'm not using it all that frequently, but knowing it's there allows you to go off to the documentation and 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 go use the right thing rather than you know writing yourself and yeah. then realizing you've missed a corner case and now you're debugging your code. Yeah, where it's already kind of set up for you. Now you're using Zip and it's iterating across your multiple lists. And yeah, it's a kind of elegant stuff that's that's there. It, it definitely expands your brain <laughs> as you learn these things. I think that takes us into projects. I guess I'll go first. This one's been around for a little while, like a few of the things that we mentioned this week, but it's called Textual Paint. Um, textual, I mentioned before, Will McGuggan's uh, Terminal TUI, the text user interface. Isaiah Odner has created this basically 
homage to MS Paint in your terminal. I, I know I covered a recent paint program called Pi D Painter, which was another kind of fun one. Uh, that was in episode 155. This is definitely more MS Paint style, but it's kind of amazing that it's using the sort of terminal text user interface blocks to create the color and so forth. It uses the pillow library, which I've mentioned recently also, to you know do the conversions to actual files and stuff like that. It does need Python 3.10 or later, it mentions which terminals it works best with. Uh, it worked pretty well inside of VS Code for me, you know, just ready to go. And then I, I installed iTerm too, just to check it out in that. I know the default one on Mac terminal was maybe a little funky, but he mentions the ones for Windows and Linux. And anyway, there's a big long feature list that it has. It was fairly easy to set up, you know, just to pip install textual dash paint. And then you just run textual paint once you've got that going. It's actually kind of more of a fun project than anything. I'm not sure how often I'll I'll use something like it. It's a little skewed. Uh, it's a little taller than it is uh, wide as far as like how stuff looks inside there. So that that's a little odd. The the pixels are are a little shaped, not quite square, but more uh, tall, rectangular. <laughs> that's the terminal. You can't can't get around that. That's the that's the, that's the size of the cursor. Yeah, and so that's kind of what you're getting for the blocks of color, which is a little weird, but. Uh, it's an impressive project. <laughs> I'm just kind of amazed that they were able to do it inside there. So, yeah, something fun. What's your project? Uh, I came across a, it's almost a doc rather than a project. Uh, it's called the Django ORM Cheat Sheet, and it's uh, posted on Django Central. So if you're not a database person, ORM stands for Object Relational Mapping, and it's a way of using object-oriented code to represent the contents in a database. There is an ORM built into Django, and as you might guess for something that is a proxy to all of SQL, <laughs> uh, it can be a little complicated, a little intimidating, yeah. uh, and that's where the cheat sheet comes in. So it starts off with some basic examples, like how to define a model that maps to a table, and then how to query objects out of the table, and there are like half dozen different ways of querying things, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So the cheat sheet includes examples on how to change chain queries together, exclude things from a query, all that kind of stuff. So once you've got querying down, it moves on to creating and updating objects, also covers how to deal with interrelated objects, showing you the three different ways of expressing that in a model, uh, along with how to query between objects. Most of that is great reminder stuff, but if you're doing a lot of Django, you probably know it well. Where the cheat sheet gets deeper is things like Q objects and F expressions, annotations, signals, dealing with dates and times, bulk updates, raw SQL, and much, much more. Yeah. So <laughs> I've spent a fair amount of time in the Django world, and, and a lot of this is the kind of stuff that, again, it's kind of like that zip stuff we were just talking about. I know this exists. I can never remember how it works. So instead of digging through the documentation, hey, there's an example right inside the cheat sheet, right? off the top. And in fact, I just used it the other day for uh, building something out for a course. I needed a queue object. I'm like, remind me how that works again. And instead of digging through the documentation, it was right there. Queue objects in a box. And I almost was almost straight out copy and paste. So uh, love this kind of resource. Yeah. And uh, so if you're deep in the Django world, it's definitely something to bookmark. Yeah. So I was thinking like, how do you, how do you organize these kinds of collections of stuff? And you Definitely use bookmarks. Uh, yeah, it depends on what it is. Some stuff I'll bookmark. Uh, some stuff I just end up going so frequently that it's in my. It gets auto completed as I start <laughs> typing it into my bar. Right, right. Uh, if I ever have to switch browsers, it'll all disappear. Uh, but yeah, it's. I used to use um, Evernote years and years ago. Oh uh, yeah. Ran into some problems with it and didn't like what they were doing with it, and so I did this massive export. So I now have a directory on my hard drive called Elephant, uh, inspired by the little icon for Evernote. And one of the directories in there is something called Tools, and I usually have like a bunch of just little MD files. So I've got one for Django. So this URL, I haven't done it yet, but that would probably end up going in that file. Yeah, okay. Because I'm on a Mac, I've got I've got those all tagged so that I can actually search for classifications and things like that, and I can use tools like Grep because I'm old. <laughs> and sure. uh, so, yeah, so it's uh, it, I have my own little pseudo database for collecting this kind of crap. That's funny. Yeah, speaking of the uh, somebody new being introduced to to something that's a little old, this this programmer kept telling his friend that he was uh, learning how to use six. 
And he's like, six, what are, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and he's like, finally looked at it and he's like, oh, you're using VI? VI. <laughs> 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 oh, it's not Roman numeral six. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to go tweet on 10. So, <laughs> there you go. Uh, fair yeah, enough. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again for bringing all these uh, projects and articles and goodies this week. Always a pleasure. See you in a couple of weeks. All right. Talk to you soon. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.